Hello everyone, welcome to another Mustafa tutorial flight. This time we're going to be taking a look at the 717. Uh, we did the, uh, the last one was with the Mad Dog, the MD-82 by Leonardo. This is by TFDI. It's been out for a few years and uh, it is actually a really, really nice aircraft. There was um, <clears throat> some crash to desktop issues uh, that they were having for quite a while uh, with this aircraft uh, regarding some view stuff. And they finally got that under control uh, several months back. And uh, ever since then, this thing has been stable and just an absolute joy to fly. It's really a fun aircraft to hand fly uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a good yoke and, uh, and set up. So, uh, but, you know, it's also very highly automated. This is kind of like the, uh, the modern version of the Mad Dog. It's a little shorter. It's uh, definitely a uh, small to a short to medium uh, haul commuter kind of aircraft. And uh, it is being phased out uh, in the real world. Uh, I think just really just Delta operates uh, it in the U.S. now. Maybe Hawaiian still has some. And then there was one operator, I think, in Europe left. And they're slowly going the way of the dodo. And uh, the coronavirus pandemic certainly hasn't helped that either. But uh, it's a fun aircraft. And so we're going to take, take a look at it. It's often known uh, as... Uh, <laughs> At least, as I like to call it, uh, the uh, the angry puppy, because we have the the mad dog, uh, and so this is kind of it's like its little brother. So we call it the angry puppy. Um, but uh, anyway, so let's go ahead and take a look at the aircraft from the outside real quick. Uh, we've got uh, just like I said, it looks very very similar to actually a DC nine, uh, which is kind of the shorter stubby version of the MD eighty. The MD eighty was a stretch of the DC nine, and oftentimes you'll see the ICAO code is actually DC-9-82-83-88, you know, whatever, uh, as the actual ICAO for the MD-80s. Uh, this is technically, technically, this is a Boeing 717, but it really is a McDonnell Douglas aircraft. It was designed by McDonnell Douglas, it was built uh, by McDonnell Douglas, uh, essentially, but uh, right around the time that Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas. And so Boeing rebranded it the Boeing 717. So, uh, while well, we look at this aircraft and you go, Boeing 717, this doesn't look like a Boeing jet at all. Well, no, it doesn't, because it's really not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Boeing bought uh, aircraft by another company. Uh, so this was originally going to be the MD-95. Uh, for those of you that know your uh, McDonnell Douglas history, there is the, uh, the MD-80 uh, series. There also was the MD-90 with, uh, with bigger engines. And then this shorter, stubbier version uh, was going to be the uh, the MD-95 until Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas and decided to uh, rebrand it. So you've got these two. It's distinguished from the DC-9 and the MD-80, uh, one by its short fuselage, but also by these really big, giant engines. So for the, such a short fuselage, the engines almost seem out of place. They're so large. Uh, and that's just, that's the way you can identify it. The other identifier for me anyway, is, um, this, this part of the engine tail cone here, uh, the engine tail cone, the engine cone on the back where the reversers are is this kind of big unpainted area. And you'll see this, uh, very often on the, uh, on the, uh, aircraft in the real world. And this is a good dead giveaway. Uh, just this look of the engine, the engine really is the giveaway for the 717. And obviously the T-tail separates it from a lot of aircraft. Um, so yeah. So we just have a come, uh, come around and have a look at this thing. It's a standard uh, tricycle gear, just like the MD-80s. Just two wheels on each of the mains and then the uh, the nose gear up here. Uh, it's, uh, but it's a cool looking bird. It's a cool looking bird. It's got three uh, pitot tubes right here on the front. One right dead center there. Well, almost dead center. And then uh, two off to the side. The angle of attack indicator is right there. You've got your uh, nose gear lights here. Your uh, landing lights are uh, retracted up into the wing. They come out just like the MD-80 does. You've got two belly cargo spots, one here and one aft. And, uh, and the APU inlet is right there at the base of the tail, you can see. And the exhaust for the APU is on the, uh, the right side here. We'll see it as we come around on the back side. Just beyond the engine, right there, there's the APU exhaust. You can see that there. So, yeah. And actually, yeah. All right. So that is the exterior of the, uh, the 717. It's quite, quite beautiful. 
it's a very lovely aircraft. This is the Power Set livery, obviously not a real world airline. Uh, this is a little plug here for Power Set. Uh, Citation Max, for those of you that know who that is, uh, started his own virtual airline and uh, called Power Set Virtual Airlines or Power Set Virtual. And uh, it is growing like a weed and it's a lot of fun to be a part of that. So uh, I am uh, obviously a member of that. And so we're going to be flying his livery today. We're in Las Vegas. If you haven't been able to figure that out already, that's we're going to do our flight out of today. Um, Las Vegas, we're going to do a short little hop over to Los Angeles, which is a perfect run for an aircraft like this and also uh, gives us a time to, uh, to actually put the aircraft through its paces for the sake of this tutorial. So let's uh, go ahead and get on the air in the uh, cockpit and we'll show you what this bird is all about. So here is the cockpit of the uh, Boeing 717. Uh, you'll notice it does not look quite like the MD-80 cockpit. It's, uh, it's a lot more digital. Uh, if you're familiar with the cockpit of the MD-11, this will feel very much at home to you. Uh, it looks very much like that, as, except for the fact that it doesn't have quite as large of windows and it's missing a third uh, engine lever. But everything else very feels very much like the MD-11. So if you have any experience with the MD-11, you will find yourself right at home with the 717 and won't be a, a problem at all. If you're familiar with the MD-80, and so if you watch the previous tutorial we did on the MD-80, uh, this will, a lot of stuff carries over. So while it's more digital, uh, the same kind of regimes uh, follow. And so uh, even some of the layout is kind of similar, we'll, we'll see here. So you won't be completely behind the eight ball. But if you're just completely used to Boeing or completely used to Airbus, I often call it McDonnell Douglas kind of a weird hybrid between, uh, uh, between Airbus and uh, Boeing. And so either one will feel a little out of place. And it, it's a little bit to wrap your brain around how some of the systems work. But uh, I think you'll get the hang of it pretty quick. So we've got the aircraft started out here in cold and dark. I'm going to slip over here into the uh, captain's chair and uh, this is what it looks like from this perspective. So you have the overhead, the typical overhead obviously, um, the aft overhead, some circuit breakers just like you do in the MD-80, and then the primary overhead here. Uh, you've got your displays which are all digital uh, CRT displays here, uh, three for each side. The gear lever separates uh, two of these on the uh, first officer side. Uh, you've got your parking brake is here with the uh, tiller for the nose wheel steering. Uh, some just instrument display switches here. Your uh, autopilot is all up here along with your uh, uh, other controls for your displays. And coming down here obviously we have our spoiler, our flap handle, throttles, fuel switches, and then a very very simplified pedestal. Um, this kind of feels, the pedestal is so simple it kind of feels like going back to like the Boeing 727 or, or 37 uh, minus the all the myriad of switches needed for all their radios but uh, it's very simplified. So you just have the, uh, the two radio heads here, a, um, a selector switch for the computer displays, your weather radar, and your TCAS is right there, and then rudder and aileron trims are back here, and a, uh, a phone <laughs> for calling the cabin, which obviously is not, uh, not simulated. Now you'll notice this tablet sitting over here uh, in the FO side. You actually have one as the captain as well. It sits down here to, to bring it up. We're going to click on it right there. And then you've got this. To send it away, you just click on the outside of the bezel there, and it goes away. I usually like to run with this gone uh, when I'm not using it, because it just feels bulky and in the way. So I'll put it away at various parts of the flight. But for this part, we need to take it out and just click on the front of the screen to turn it on. You can actually change this background, I just discovered. Uh, so the instructions to do that are in the uh, one of the setup manuals. Basically, you create an image uh, of your own liking to the dimensions they specify, and you put it in the correct folder with the correct name. And you can even specify this background to be specific to an air aircraft tail number. Uh, so you can have different backgrounds for different liveries if you want to have an airline specific, which is kind of cool, which I think I'm going to do. I just haven't had a chance to do it yet. So I think that's just kind of awesome. So anyway... Uh, but in here, this is where you go into all of your all of your settings for this aircraft to deal with things. So I'm going to start actually over here with settings and uh, some things that are important. So systems, first of all, here's that pause at top of descent switch. This is something that some people will use if they want to go sleep while the aircraft's in cruise, but they don't want to overfly their top of descent. <laughs> so I don't ever use this, so I leave it unchecked because I don't. I'm not one of those people that sleeps while doing their flying. Uh, if you're worried about frames on your aircraft, you can uh, turn off the displays for either the captain or the FO side, so that way 
Uh, if you want to save a few frames, if your computer's not quite as uh, beefy as some, uh, and you're always flying over here, you could turn off these three, and that'll save you some uh, some uh, CPU space. Uh, tablet auto lock. This will just where the tablet kind of automatically times out. You can increase or decrease this down. I just have it set at a minute. And then sounds. Uh, this is where you can set what sound device your aircraft uh, will use and the systems will use. So if you have multiples like me, I'm using the Elgato um, Wavelink now, and so I've got all these things, and I want it to come through the game side. So I got to set that in here, and then you can change the volume. Uh, mute on lost focus. If you click out, if you have more than one screen, you click outside the sim. It'll mute the sim, the sounds of the uh, aircraft. You can turn that off in P3D, but the aircraft sim. Uh, will mute if you do that if that is checked uh, regardless of what the P3E sounds are doing so that's what that is so if you care uh, over here on status so this is where we're going to see our what is currently loaded on the aircraft as far as our center of gravity our gross weight and our zero fuel weight and also the uh, the very important um, panel state so uh, cold and dark ready to start ready to fly uh, I always operate in uh, cold and dark, and so that's what we're in right now. That's why the aircraft is dark and cold. We're going to come back to that screen a little bit later. Documents, uh, you can uh, put a checklist in here or any other documents you want to reference from the tablet. Especially helpful if you don't have a second monitor like I do, uh, and you need a quick way to access stuff uh, for the aircraft for your flight. That's a way to do it. I don't personally use that, but that's there for you. Uh, crew, this is one of the few aircraft that comes with a shared cockpit option, and it is actually pretty cool. I've used it a number of times uh, for myself, and it is awesome. So, uh, yeah, there's a I'm not going to go through how to set that up. It's really not that complicated, but uh, there's instructions in the thing. You need, obviously, a person to do that with. They need to have this plane as well, and an internet connection that's solid, and things like that. So, some obvious things. And then finally, exterior. This is where you can uh, set up ground power, uh, open and close the doors, uh, set out cones and wheel chocks and all that, all that good stuff. So we're going to do a few of those real quick. We're going to turn on ground power, first of all, because we're going to need some power for the aircraft. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set the wheel chocks, and I'll put out the safety cones just because. And I'm going to leave everything else for now um, closed up. And actually, with the one exception, I'm going to go ahead and bring over the jetway so now this is gsx this is not part of the tutorial because this is not part of the aircraft this is just some stuff i have this is by evis dream team highly recommended it's an awesome program it works with almost every aircraft and can be a little buggy sometimes uh but you know what for something that works with almost every aircraft at every airport you know what it's going to happen occasionally so for the most part very good and look at this look at this immersion look at this immersion so the jetway's coming over. This is the only thing that bugs me. They got this like uh, uh, rotating beacon equivalent down here, and it will never turn off. And it will illuminate, it'll blink my cockpit red uh, the entire time. You can see it. Now this is scenery for LA, uh, Los, Las Vegas, but it's even, like you can see into the jetway. It's cool. So it's going to come over. It's going to come down. He's going to connect. This is the one thing I don't like about Flight Sim is he... If you're too close, you get that nonsense. So just look away. See how the tablet turned itself off? That's that auto lock after a minute. Okay, so now we can open up the uh, main passenger door and actually simulate that there's people in here. And there we go. And so now I'm going to close that, put it away. All right, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you, I'm going to go through the startup sequence for this aircraft. Um, some of it is based on what... The manual says to do and some of it is based on a system that I use so I don't forget stuff. So it's going to be a little bit of a hybrid of that. Uh, the first part will be uh, by the book and then the kind of the second part overview is, um, is me doing my version. Uh, ultimately develop a system that works for you to uh, once you know where all the systems are to, to make sure you're checking everything every time. Um, airlines uh, typically have their own SOPs as far as a flow for the aircraft and how they do it and they teach their pilots to memorize that the sit and do it the same way every time and so the idea is you have a a flow that you do and then you have a checklist that backs up the flow it's never a, a checklist is very rarely a do list it's just a hey these were the highlight things that absolutely had to happen let's make sure they did happen but just because they're not the checklist doesn't mean it's not in the flow and so that's just something you've got to know the difference of so given that 
We're going to start up here at the uh, the electrical panel. Actually, I'm going to give you kind of an overview of the of the overhead panel first, just to kind of give you uh, some <laughs> idea of where things are. So, at, starting at the top here, you've got your uh, your IRSs. This is your um, uh, inertial reference unit. Uh, the middle one is in op. It's just the the one and two right there. So just know that. Uh, some cargo smoke uh, detectors right here. Uh, APU fire APU controls and fire controls to the APU. Um, up here is your hydraulic panel, and you can see how these panels are all separated, so it kind of keeps everything, you know, separate and nice. And so while it looks at first glance like a myriad of switches, it's all laid out very well. So you got your hydraulics, your electrical panel right here, your air panel, so this is like bleed air and air conditioning and stuff like that, your engine control, so engine starting and ignition, fuel control panel, uh, this is your uh, GPWS, this is the, um, or EGPWS, is, I think it is, Electronic Ground Proximity Warning System. Uh, you've got your takeoff and landing pressurization section right here. Ice protection, um, kind of basically enunciators and, and some things like that. And then ba down here is primarily all lights uh, for the most part with uh, some seatbelt indicators and stuff like that. And then also... Um, your windshield wiper on the other side. So that's the overhead panel and then obviously right here you've got your your autopilots and your stuff and we kind of talked about this already. So what we're going to do is we're going to start right with the electrical panel. The first thing we got to do is we got to put power on the aircraft, right? So we start with the battery. You just click it once. You'll notice it uh, turned to the side. Like in the Mad Dog you got to click it twice to lock it. It does the lock for you in this one. So when you hit that, you get that uh, thing there. You'll see you got a um, available light on the exterior power because we already connected that. Now, if we didn't have that and we turned that on, we would have no other power. You notice that there's nothing really on. The standby um, is coming in right here, but beyond that, there's really nothing. The battery didn't do much, and it's not, especially not with your emergency power set to off, <laughs> which we're not going to turn on right now anyway. So if you wanted to do the APU, you could do that. We're going to start the APU a little bit later, but if you wanted to do that, you would need to turn the start pump on, which is right down here. You would then need to come down here to the master APU switch to run and then hold it to start for a few seconds and let it go. And it would take about 30 seconds or so for the APU to spool up to power. And then you get the available light there and put it on. So we are going to go ahead and put on our external power right there by clicking that. And now you hear the aircraft come to life. What a fun sound. And you'll see we've got uh, power now on the, uh, the right MCDU. Eventually here we'll get power on the left MCDU. And it will take about two minutes for your screens to come on. The aircraft's basically running through a series of self-tests right now. And so as it does that... Um, we're just kind of waiting for that and watching that. It's going to run the sticks, uh, the, the yokes through a stick shaker and stick pusher test program. You'll hear and see that in a moment. And it'll go through that twice, and then shortly thereafter you'll see the screens come to life here. And so we're just going to kind of watch this and watch what boots up here as it does its thing. Because there's really not much we can do until the aircraft is uh, fully powered on anyway. So you just got to give that a moment. As we wait, for those of you that are underneath, there's a stick shaker right there, and there's a stick pusher, and it'll do that sequence again, stick shaker, stick pusher, there it goes. For those of you that don't know what happens in a stall regimen when you're when you're about to stall an aircraft, uh, the way the aircraft senses the stall as it approaches the stall, you're not in the stall yet, you'll get that stick shaker, and in a real aircraft, it's you'll you'll feel it in the yoke. It's like uh, force feedback almost, and it just shakes the stick, and you'll hear it too, and that's your indication that hey, you're about to stall this aircraft. You better push the nose down, and if you don't. After it gets a little bit slower, the aircraft will do it for you, and that's what the stick pusher is. So it will be like, okay, you're not getting the point here, pal. We're pushing the nose forward because if you stall the aircraft, you're going to die. If we push the nose forward, you may die still, but, you know, at least it's not as guaranteed. So anyway. All right, so now you see our uh, displays have all come up. And now we're going to run through a series of tests, and the point of this is to test to make sure these systems are working at the beginning of the day, but also is a um, 
good time to let the uh, IRS system kind of spool up. So the IRS system, if you come over here, I'm going to show you in my own tablet. This is not part of the sim. Uh, just know that this is part of uh, my setup for live streaming. This is the TFDI add-on manager you're seeing up here in the tablet window. You're, what you're actually doing is you're looking at my second screen, and I'm just using a tablet to kind of make it look kind of interesting. Um, but this is where you do your loadouts and stuff like that. But also in your options under customize here, you can set some things for your system, such as... Uh, IRS or ADIRU alignment time, which is that. The realistic is about 10 minutes long. Short is about 3 minutes, and instant is about 15 seconds. So I have it on short, so it'll take about 3 minutes to align the IRS. Um, you can set that to however you like, if you want to use realistic, but I find 3 minutes is a nice compromise, so I'm not sitting here forever. Uh, you can also then change things on the wind indicators, uh, map symbology for U.S. versus European, uh, temperature units and weight units. Uh, I'm in America, so I'm using the imperial units, uh, but uh, we use uh, Celsius for temperature because that's the language of aviation. Everything's in Celsius, so you might as well keep it keep it the same. And uh, you got several options here for your engine thrust ratings and stuff like that. So go through those and, and see how you want to uh, set up your aircraft. We're going to come back to this in a moment. Uh, but not right now. So I just want to make sure you see that before we do this uh, alignment here. So we're going to come up here and switch these two to nav. Again, this guy does nothing. It's it's in op. It's got a little in op sticker there. So don't worry about that guy. And once we switch those to um, align, we're going to come down here to our uh, MCDU, go to the FMC. You can verify in here that you're on the correct uh, ARAC uh, nav database, which uh, it looks like we are October through November and uh, which is good. Uh, again, you don't have to fly with updated uh, AIRAC data. That's, a, that's a, a thing I pay for, a service I pay for through Navigraph. Highly recommended if you're gonna fly on VATSIM and stuff like that, but uh, not required. So that's, I check that to make sure my stuff's working. All we're gonna do in this page right now, we're gonna set the rest of it up later, but all we're gonna do right now is just put our from and to. So we're gonna say we're at KLAS slash K-L-A-X, which is where we're going. So Las Vegas to Los Angeles. I'm just going to put that in the from and to and ignore all of that right now. And, sorry, push the wrong button. <laughs> Don't. That was a notice, not a, a button to push. And you said, see now where it says align IRS. So now that it knows where we are and, and we have the uh, IRS switch is turned on, now we can see this initialize IRS. So we're going to push that. And ignore that not allowed nonsense. And it will change to position reference. And if we click that, you'll notice the IRS line is blank here. If we scroll over a bit, by the way, you see this is one of three with an arrow. That means there's three pages here I can page to. Uh, the IRS are blank, but the GNS, which is the GPS system, is showing where we are. So when the, when the uh, system is fully aligned, these will populate with a, uh, a lat long. So we can kind of keep it on the screen to verify that our IRS is aligned. But now while it's doing that, we're going to run a series of tests to bide our time. And we're going to run them in a very particular order. We're going to start with the hydraulics and we're going to kind of zigzag across the panel to do a series of specific tests that it wants us to do at the very beginning of the day. So first we're going to come down here to this uh, page and we're going to choose the hydraulic page. And that brings up right here. I'm going to move it up here so you guys can see it really well. So you see our hydraulics, we've got... Um, hydraulic tanks and then pressure on the systems and obviously the systems are pressurized zero. In the real world you want to verify with the ground handling crews that everyone was clear of the aircraft when you did this because it will pressurize the hydraulics and if there are any systems that are in a droop state or something else or in a in a different state than is commanded in the aircraft they will suddenly go to their commanded position and that could really hurt somebody if they're in the wrong place. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and assume there's everyone's clear. We turn on the aux pump first and we get, we're looking for 2,800 PSI or better. And so we got 3,000 PSI, so we're good. And then we turn on the trans pump that opens up this, and it's going to power the secondary system here. And 28 or better, 28 on the dot, so we're good. So that means our hydraulic test is good. So we're going to turn them back off again so they can start messing with the aircraft, not have to worry about hydraulics. They will slowly spin down, and we can pull that away. So that's a good test. The next test we're going to do is over here at the EGPWS system. We're going to 
You can click this real quick for a kind of a shortened test, or the full test, you got to hold this down for a few seconds. So Glide hold that slow. down. I'm going to leave it held down for a moment. Pull up. Terrain, terrain. And then I'm going to let it go. Up. And it Sink will go rate. through its test here. Pull up. Terrain. Don't sink. Don't sink. Too low, gear. Too low, flaps. Too low, terrain. Glide slope. Bank angle, bank angle. Too low, terrain. Caution, terrain. Terrain, terrain. Pull up. All right, so that uh, takes care of our EGBWS test. So we're now going to zigzag down to the power panel, and we need to test our emergency power. So we're going to flip that to arm. Notice the on light comes on. And down here on our EAD, this is our uh, alerting panel, we see emergency power test. And we're going to wait for this test to go away, and it shouldn't say emergency power test failed. When it just goes away, that means it's a good test. So if we come up here, we now see that on light is off, the power is just armed, that's a good test. We're going to cycle over here to the ice panel, and this switch right here, if you push this down, is the ice protection test. We're going to look at the same thing. Um, try to get to where I can see. So watch this message right here as I push this down and release. Wing ice detect pass. So it's tested its system, it's good. Over here to the fuel panel. And so we need to go ahead and pull up the fuel page. And we're going to hold this button for two seconds. 1001, 1002, and let it go. And you see these X's come up over to the tanks and we get fuel 9,000 pounds. That's what we're looking for. That's how we know we're testing in progress. And if we come down here, we'll see fuel system test. So when this goes back to normal, we'll know we're good. And provided it doesn't give us a fuel system fail, then we'll have a good test there as well. So I'm going to wait for that fuel test to run its course. You'll notice now while we're doing that, the, uh, the IRS uh, numbers have populated, so our IRS is now fully aligned, which is good because one of the tests we're coming up to is going to require that to be aligned, so that's why we do that first before we do these, so we're not sitting around waiting for three to ten minutes, depending on how you have that set for uh, <laughs> that to do its thing. There it goes. So it's gone back to uh, what we had in the tank before. Uh, this is crossed out right now for gross weight because we haven't put in our performance data yet, so it doesn't have a way of knowing what that is. So that's normal, but everything else goes back to clear. The men message cleared, there's no fail indication, so that's a good test on the fuel system. All right. And after we have tested the fuel system, we come down to, uh, to below here, and we're going to test the gear. So you're going to unlatch the gear, unlock the gear, and you do that by right-clicking on the gear handle there. Whoops, so, hang on, there you go. Left click and drag, or right click and drag, rather. Sorry. And uh, you see uh, we get four red lights, I'm uh, sorry, three red lights, I can't count. Three red lights on the gear, and that's a good test. That tells us that when it's unlatched, it's giving us that warning. Left click on that, we'll push it back in, we get our three green again. That's all we're looking for for that test. We're going to come down now and test our stab trim. And to do that, we need to put this on the config page, which is right here. And we're going to be looking for that stabilizer trim number. And so what I'm going to do, I have a yoke physically in, in my room here. And so I'm going to be pushing on these on my yoke to move the stab trim. We're verifying that these actually do move the stab trim electrically uh, when I do that. So we're going to push it down, first of all. And it moves to about one down. I'm going to pull it back to neutral to zero. And it did. Now what we're going to do is down here, the stabilizer trim cutoff... <laughs> We're going to set that's off. Now what that did is it disabled this electric uh, trim control on the uh, yoke. So I'm going to try it again, and we shouldn't see it move now. So I push it up, you see that there, and no movement. Push it down, no movement. But we have to verify that with that happening, I can still move it with this, uh, this uh, long form trim. So we click on there, and it does move. Let it go, right click, we'll put it back to zero. There you go. So that is a good test. We make sure we turn that back on or we won't be able to trim the aircraft without doing that. We don't want to do that. And that's a good test. And then finally we come down and this is where we do the TCAS test and this has to have the IRS aligned for this. So we just click that down to test and back. 
and we listen for TCAS test pass. TCAS test pass. All right. So that is all of the tests that you have to do in the very beginning here to kind of start the aircraft up. Now, from this point on, if we were going to be using GSX to load people, which I'm not going to do, this is where I would start the process of saying, okay, we're ready to start loading passengers on board the aircraft. Uh, the one last thing, though, that we would do before we did that, um, if we were in the real aircraft, is I would make sure I either had a ground cart for air or the APU air going so we could have air conditioning in the cabin. And then also we would want to make sure this emergency lights were armed for the system, as well as the seatbelt signs. So we would take care of our, our seatbelt signs there for the passengers. I'm, it's not as big of a deal right now because we're not really simulating the whole passenger experience today. It's more about flying the aircraft. But uh, we want to make sure that was done as well. So with that all done, we're going to start. Now this is where I deviate from the manual. I'm just going to work my way down the panel and set, make sure everything here is set as I need it to. And I do this in a flow so that I can see it. But So we start up here with this uh, cargo smoke test. And... Uh, a note about uh, this aircraft uh, when holding down buttons. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do this and show you how this works. If I left click and hold this, it it Cargo will smoke. stay in. But as soon as I move my Cargo my smoke. mouse off and I'm still holding the left mouse button, if I let go, it comes back out. See that? Now watch this. If I hold this down and right click on another button or switch, I can override that ability for it to come back out. So if I click. Cargo smoke. Right click. And now I have Cargo let go smoke. of all the mouse buttons. And it stays Cargo in. Smoke. Which is very handy, especially for this test. Cargo smoke. So we're going to verify this test. We got the Cargo lights. Smoke. We have the audible. We're going to come down here and Cargo notice smoke. that that's there. And if we click on the, Cargo see smoke. how the air panel is lit up? This should silence Cargo it. Smoke. It silenced it, but the alert, the test is still going. We verify we've got these uh, indicators here. And it's still lit up here, so we know that is a good test now. And now we can silence it by, or end the test by clicking on that button again and pulls that away. So that's a very nice trick. If you ever need to hold down a button somewhere, um, just right click on another button while holding the left and it will, it will keep it locked in, which is very helpful. All right, so we've done the cargo smoke test. That is good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. So this is the APU. We're going to start the APU in a little bit. I'm not going to do it right now, uh, but this is where we would uh, start the APU, start switch, and the air switch. I just work my way down these panels and just check and make sure everything's in the position I want it to be. There's really nothing I want to do down here. Uh, down here in the lights page, I usually will turn up my panel lighting. The, uh, the knob is for the flood, which in the daytime we do not need, so I'm going to leave the floods off. This is the dome light right here, which again, we don't really need in the daytime. So we're going to leave that off, but I do want the panel backlightings uh, to be on. Uh, over here we have, uh, I'm just going to move the APU switch down to the on position. So that way when we do kick the APU on, it will automatically connect over. And I don't have to remember or forget and pull the ground power and then all my power shuts off. And I have to redo everything. That's really annoying. But I want to make sure my uh, bus ties are all in auto. My DC bus ties are in auto. Um, the gen switches are all on, which they are. You kind of default to that. So that's good. My uh, hydraulic pumps are all set to on or auto for the engine, so when they come on, the hydraulics will come on as well. The uh, packs are set to off right now because we don't have any um, uh, air, but I do want to make sure this is set to open. This, there's three positions. There's closed, open, and auto. And so for engine start, in the beginning we have that open. Once the engines are going, we'll put that into auto. So that way the air systems are split and only will uh, pull from the other side if it needs to do that. Uh, the bleeds are all in auto as well, so that's good. Fuel pumps will stay off for the time being. We've already done the fuel system test, so we don't need to worry about that. As we come back up here, we've already done the GPWS uh, test. And I think this is all in... Yeah, system is in is in auto. If manual will light up if it's in manual, you want that system in auto. And as we come down here, we're going to go ahead and set our uh, windshield anti-ice to on. If you're in freezing conditions or really below 6 degrees C and within 3 degrees of dew point, uh, you'll want to turn on your other uh, anti-ice type systems. But you always have the anti-ice on the windshield. That is really to heat the windows to make them more pliable for when you get up to the really cold temperatures in the upper atmosphere. And so that always goes on at the start of this. 
We're also going to do this enunciator test. That's right here. So I'm going to pull this back. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to click it. And then I'm going to right click on another button so I can let go. And so we're going to verify that all of our lights, wherever I have lights or indicators, are on. And it's going to show us all of these kind of fun things over here. We're basically just looking for anything that should be lit up that's not, because that would be an indication of a bulb that's out that we'd need to replace. And all that looks good, so uh, we can go ahead and undo that. And then finally, uh, down here on the lights panel, we've already set the seatbelt signs, we already set the emergency lights. Uh, we want to make sure the nav lights are on. Uh, the logo light doesn't need to be on, it's the middle of the day. Beacon, obviously we're not starting our engines yet, so we'll leave that. And high intensities, this will go on, this is the strobes. So we put those on usually right as we're about to enter or cross a, a runway, and they stay on until we're on the ground and we're clear of all the active runways. So we'll leave that alone for now. Windshield wipers, we can just make sure they're parked. And that clears the overhead panel and is done with that. We're going to come around here on the other side and we're going to test our oxygen first of all. Switch that to the emergency and that should give us a continuous stream. Switch it back. That's a good test on the oxygen. Uh, this is the radio panel down here, which we don't really need to mess with, but it's there. Uh, the parking brake, obviously we already verified that it was in the uh, uh, park position. That's up, pulled up, pushed down is released. Uh, it's this floor lighting and map lighting. We don't really need to mess with that. All of the uh, instrument systems. Looking across here, just making sure all these systems are working. We're going to want to set our uh, altimeter here in a moment. I can see on the other side of this thing. By the way, you can pull this out of the way by clicking at the base of that. And now I can see uh, 2992 on the, uh, on the display there. I'm going to go check my weather here real quick in Active Sky and just see what this is. Since I don't have an ATIS here, uh, looks like that is still the latest weather. It's going to change here in just a little bit, but uh, for now we're getting a 3003 for the altimeter. So we'll go ahead and set that. So up here where it says Barrow Set, I think this is where we do this at. Yeah, 3003. Oops, there we go. 3003, and I think it sends it on both sides. It does. So yes, yeah, so you don't have to go over and do the FO side. It will. It, it's got them slaved together. So you want to make sure you set that. Uh, we're going to not really mess with the auto flight system until we uh, program up the box down here. So we just kind of verify a few things. We're going to do a fire test real quick here. Fire, right engine. And that's the fault light. Fire, right engine. Fire, left engine. And that is a good test. So you got the uh, fault test right there. And it's, you see this fire... Fire detect L fail, fail, and then those will clear. In the Mad Dog, you got to hold both of these to get it to test, and this one you just hold the one. So uh, We already did the gear test, and the gear is down. We verified that. The spoilers are retracted. The uh, flaps are up and set down. I'm sorry, flaps are up, not set down. I'm just messing with my own mind here. Throttles are idle, and the fuel switches right there are cut off. And then uh, we just would verify any uh, radio stuff we'd set here today. I'm just, we're not going to be on VATSIM. I'm just going to do this out of habit. 122.8 uh, two, is the uh, Unicom frequency that we use in VATSIM when we don't have air traffic control. And so we set that there. And then on the uh, uh, transponder, if I don't have a transponder code that I'm given, then I would set 2000, which is the uh, default IFR code, as opposed to 1200, which is the VFR code. Since we are an airliner, we'll set that. Weather radar is off. We could test the weather radar if we want to do that real quick. Monitor radar display. Go around. Wind shear ahead. Wind shear ahead. Wind shear ahead. That's my favorite part of that test because he gets so adamant. Wind shear ahead. Wind shear ahead. Wind shear ahead. <laughs> Cracks me up. All right. So all that is done, we're basically ready now to uh, set up the uh, what I call setting up the box, which is the uh, the MCDU. And so this is going to be going to be one of the most complicated things for most people because uh, if they're not used to how you set these up, it's a little little different than you might be used to. So we already did the uh, the from and to the uh, KLAS to KLAX, and so what I can do um, there you you. When I put that in, you may have noticed there was a route up here that showed, not on this page, but in the, in the next page over. And that's how you would bring your route in 
uh, if you have it saved, which I do, but I want to show you the long form of this because anyone can do the, the shortcut way. Uh, if you can figure out the long form way, then the shortcut way is easy. Uh, it's, if I show you the shortcut way, though, then you'll be like, well, what if I don't know how to do that and I can't do... So, yeah. So, KLAS to KLAX. Our alternate is uh, Ontario, which is K-O-N-T. So, we're going to enter that. Basically, you're trying to enter stuff wherever there's boxes. And so, there's no route to ONTs. So that's fine. So, we just say return. Puts that in there. And uh, there's our lat long that it, it did with the IRS. Our flight number today is PSV232. We can stick that in there. And then our cruise level uh, for this is only 280. There's actually a, um, uh, a standard operating procedure between LAX and uh, Las, Las Vegas for no higher than that altitude. So uh, Simbrief will try to give you higher. If, there's VAT, if you're flying on VATSIM and, they're, and they are, are, uh, those airspaces are under control, they will force you to go to a lower uh, cruise level. So uh, 280 is what we're going to set right there. And uh, this stuff down here is not um, simulated, so just don't worry about trying to do stuff there. Some, some stuff in here is not simulated, that's one of them. Uh, cost index, um, typically I've got 30 in here for this, so we're going to set that. And then you see this is page one of three, so then we just page over to the next page, and we're going to put in our stuff here. So I'm looking at uh, my flight plan from Simbrief that they've given me, and... Uh, before I do this, actually, I should have done this. I'm sorry, I'm doing this a little out of order. Um, we need to actually do the load up on the aircraft itself. So I'm going to come over here uh, just for reference. So this right here, 68.1, you can kind of barely see it. I'm going to zoom in on it for you here so you can see it better. And let's see, I'm going to try and I think if I go here, you can see it even when I have the tablet up because I'm going to put my tablet up here in a second. So this is this is a uh, uh, Sim Toolkit Pro. <clears throat> so you're seeing my um, flight plan here. I've got 127 passengers, 200 pounds of cargo, zero fuel weight of 97,550, which obviously is much less than 68.1 because I've got the aircraft empty right now. So if we pull up the uh, the TFDI guy here, uh, what did I just say, passengers? 127. So we slide this guy over to 127, which is almost full. And that gives us a zero fuel weight of 95,140. We should have a zero fuel weight of 97,550. So we're going to bring up the cargo numbers a little bit at a time. I know that just went away. 97,540. That's really close. 97,550, 540. I'll take it. So that's that's about as close we're going to get. So we're, our our uh, <coughs> uh, uh, payload weight bleh, uh, is, ver is pretty much set now. So now fuel. It's saying we need 9,451 pounds of fuel. And so what we can do is actually we can just go up here and do that. 9,000, what was it? I already forgot. <laughs> 9,451. I think I can anywhere. 9,451. Enter. There we go. And so it has put our fuel on. So it's 47.25 on each side. And uh, our zero fuel weight now 97,540. Our gross weight 106,990. And I can I can verify the gross weight with the ramp weight 107,001. It's a little different, but that's not bad. Uh, nine, nine, it's actually off by about 10 pounds. And if you recall, our zero fuel weight's off by about 10 pounds. So I couldn't get it quite perfect. So we're right on the money. So we're good. So that those numbers check. Now what we need to do is make sure that that number 97.5 and it might actually come off as 97.6 because it may round it up. Although it should round it down because we're actually 97.540. So it should be 97.5. Uh, we want to make sure when we send the payload to the sim, I'm going to click on this over here again, that, that number shows that. So we're going to say send payload to sim. Now observe, 97.5. Now watch when I send the fuel to the sim. That number just changed back by about 1,000 pounds, a little bit more. 1,500 pounds or so. So then we send the payload one more time. <laughs> and it puts it right back. Now we're at 1070. So I don't know why it does that. I'm not sure what's happening when you do that, when you send the payload and then send the fuel, why you have to do that again. But I have noticed that that is the, the, the order of operations. And if you try and send the fuel first 
it also doesn't work right. So d that's not like the, oh, I'll just send the fuel first and then do that last. I tried that. So just do payload, fuel, payload again, and then just verify your numbers are good, and then you're set to go. So I'm going to turn that back off. Get that out of the way. So with that, also you want to make a note of this number right here. Whoops. 16.1. Uh, that is our, um, our center of gravity number. So 16.1. So actually I'm going to put that in here before I forget. 16.1. Take off CG. And I'm going to put that for both of them. 16.1. So our uh, block fuel was 94, something or other. 94.5. Sorry, 9.4. It's actually 9.5. It's probably what's coming in as because it's going to round it up. So we'll put 9.5. Uh, it says 9.4. So we'll go 9.4. 9.4 is block. There we go. Uh, zero fuel weight was 97.5 and takeoff weight 106.4. Now, bear in mind, that number does not say 107.0. Why is that? Why are we short by 600 pounds? Well, because we have to taxi. So it is figuring in a taxi fuel amount and subtracting that because this is takeoff gross weight not ramp gross weight ramp gross weight is 1070 uh takeoff weight is, is slightly less so so that those numbers all check out we're good there and we're going to hit that page one more time there really isn't anything to do here if you're going to take ballast fuel or something like that you could put that in there but yeah we're not doing that so that's all ready to go we're going to go over here to init that actually no, that wasn't it we're going to go to flight plan now and here you have KLAS to KLAX, but there's nothing in between. So we got to put the flight plan in. So what we're going to do, we're going to hit uh, LAS and say SID. And today the wind right now in Las Vegas is showing, uh, well, it was 0607. Now it's 0507. That just updated here. We're 3004 on the altimeter, too. I'm going to have to change that. But um, basically what, th what that means is um, Las Vegas is using the ones. And I checked that with um, FlightAware. They're actually in real life are using the ones. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to plan on one right, I believe it is, for takeoff. So one right, and we're doing the Boach 8. And it's the Ricky transition off Boach 8. And I'm going to show you the chart for this in just a second. So Ricky transition, one right, and we're going to say insert. And that populates our flight plan. There you start seeing that on the thing there. And now we got a discontinuity after after Ricky. So this is where we go and look at our flight plan here. And so after Ricky, we have Shatner and then the Angel 4 arrival. But the but Shatner is the entry point to the Angel 4. So we're basically going from a SID directly to a star. So I'm not gonna put Shatner in here. If I if I had other points between the stars, I would put them here and just line select where that flight plan discontinuity is but we're not going to do that so we're going to go to LAX and we're going to select star and we're going to say we're going to do the Angel 4 we're looking for the Shatner transition so use the there it is Shatner and then we're going to do uh, the ILS it's just an I ILS 24 right which is right there we're going to fly in right by the, uh, the in and out. All right, so 2-4 right right there. All that's set, and we insert. If you made a mistake here, you would do the uh, uh, lat revision right here, and it would just take you back. So we insert that. And when I did that, it actually brought up another page because it's wanting to know what the transition from the Angel 4 star to the approach for uh, ILS from my 2-4 is. Is it Circus or Sivu? Now, I can tell you from experience, it's most likely going to be Circus because the direction we're coming in but let's look at the chart and we'll verify that together so I'm gonna go ahead and bring open the tablet one more time here and we're gonna close out of that oops I'm gonna close out of that this is Navigraph by the way highly recommend you uh, subscribing Navigraph because you can get all these charts and it's fantastic it's only about nine bucks a month or so it's well worth it so we're going to look at the Angel 4 arrival into Los Angeles, coming in from the Shatner waypoint, which is right there. 
And that brings us all the way down to, hey, lo and behold, Circus. Look at that. So that tells us right there. We're coming in at Circus. So I'm going to go ahead and take that away. And we will select Circus. All right, so you notice now we have a discontinuity between uh, Ricky and Shatner. So to take care of that, because we know those points need to connect, we just hit Clear. And we're going to clear the discontinuity. It moves them up together. And we're going to move through here. And there's Circus. So that's taking all the way through to the end of the round. Jetsa, runway 24. There we go. And anything after that is the, uh, the missed approach. So we are set. So now what uh, we would do here is we would go through and verify um, our altitudes with all of these on the chart. And uh, I will do that at a certain point. But uh, just to make sure that we're not, uh, it's got all of our um, crossing restrictions and speed restrictions in there. So we'll go over those in a moment. But in the meantime, that's done and that's set to go. So now we just go over here to take off and arrival. And we need to set some information here. Now, here's where we could flex. Now, there is no, there's no like calculator on this aircraft to figure this out. So you just have to kind of do your best guess if you want to flex. If you don't want to flex, just leave that blank and you'll be using Toga. Um, today, it's, uh, it's not a hot day here in Vegas. I mean, it's only, what was it, temperature 2-2. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not a hot day in Vegas. We're not at serious uh, altitude. Um, and we've got a nice long runway, so I think we are going to flex a little bit. So I'm just going to go ahead and put in um, a flex temp of 50 in there. And you see it changed my EPR rate down to 1.42. So this is just me, the go in my mind, going, you know what, i got lots of runway. I'm not going to be, you know, overly heavy. We don't have a lot of fuel on board, so we've got a lot of things to do. There's absolutely, in the real world, serious calculations that go through and make sure you can do this. But uh, in the flight sim world, we kind of have to... Uh, wing it a little bit so or just not flex the whole point of this by the way is not to save fuel it's to save the engines this is all about putting less takeoff power on the engines and therefore extending their life and maintenance costs uh, you'll actually when you flex you actually end up burning more fuel uh, to a certain extent because you're you know taking longer to climb you're taking longer to take off and those engines are the, the fuel savings don't that 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 uh, crossing point doesn't happen all right, so flaps. Um, the way this works in this aircraft, I'm going to move you over here a little bit, is we have what's called dial-a-flap. Now, what we generally do for takeoff, and you can do differently, but generally we're just going to set flaps 13 for takeoff. That's pretty standard. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. But if you wanted to, you can use this dial here and select any amount of flaps you want from 1 to 20 and when it's in the dial a flap position there it will select that flap indicator and so that can be useful when you're doing approach more than anything else um, but generally speaking um, I don't mess with it too much so I'm just gonna leave it in in its stow position right there so when we pull this down it's gonna be flap 13 so uh, we're going to go ahead and tell it we're going to be flap 13. Stab trim needs to be 5.6. You'll see that there. And then here it wants a slope and a wind. Now in P3D there is no slope. In the real world there's a slope on the runway because it's not perfectly flat. But P3D doesn't simulate that so we can say zero. But we do have a wind component. So if we look over at the, uh, the wind again, we see the wind is 0, 050 0 at 7 knots. So that's a... Um, it's going to be a headwind, but it's a more of a crosswind than anything else. But so it's not, it's, uh, what is it, 40 degrees off the nose. So you can start to kind of just kind of guess in your mind. It's not going to be a full seven knot headwind. It's probably even closer to like a four knot headwind at that point. So um, there's actually a calculation you can do to find it. I'm just going to go ahead and hit four. And I think I have to, I'm trying to remember if I have to, yeah, that works. If you do a negative number, it'll be a tailwind. So, um, Otherwise, it assumes it's a headwind. So, zero headwind four. And then it wants to know the outside air temperature according to the uh, uh, ATIS here. It is 2.2. Two. Oh, sorry. You had to put the Celsius on there. 2.2C. Two, two and that will give you your V speeds. So now we can check the V speeds 131, 134, 140. Now, you might be saying, well, you can get the, the, the temperature right there. Because look at it, it's right there. It says it's 2.1. And you can. 
Um, this, in the real world, I'm told, this number does not really work when you're just sitting on the ground. <laughs> so uh, this number will be all, all off and, and nutso. Uh, so that's why we'd get it off the ATIS. But in this case, this probably is the same as what it actually is right now, and so the ATIS is off by because it's just not perfectly up to date. So I'm using 2-2. Two, two. We're off by a degree. It's not the end of the world. But it is what it is. So 131, 134, 140, we're going to come over here and we're going to say 140 on the speed. This is our V2 speed, so this is our climb safety speed. This will give us, if we hold 140, we will climb out as fast as we can uh, with the power we have available. That's how that works. And so in an engine out situation, that is critical. Uh, for these other numbers, we're going to have to look at the chart again. And so I'm going to come back to our Las Vegas charts, and we're going to get some information. And this will kind of double as our departure brief at the same time. So I'm going to pull up the tablet. And we're sitting over here at Bravo 15 at the gate. We're planning to take off on runway 1 right, which is 9,771 feet long. And it's got a heading of 14 degrees. So make a note of 14 degrees. Okay, we're going to take off. Our SID is the Boach 8. And the Boach 8, we take off at uh, 14 degrees. And then after, when we cross 2,682 feet at or above, then we can start making our turn to Bessie, a left-hand turn over to Bessie, and a max of 230 knots. Okay? After Bessie, we don't have the speed max anymore, except for the fact that once, as long as we're below 10,000, we've got to be below 250. We then head over to Whitla, and we need to be above 7,900 feet, but below 10,000 feet. Jeb, and then we have to cross Boach at or above 13,000 feet. By then, we should be plenty above. And then Ricky is our our uh, our end point. So we're not going to Zelma and John 2 and Level or 29 Palms. Our point ends there, and you see right here on the chart, it says Ricky Ricky. This is an exit point. doesn't look like it is, but it is. That is an end point. So that's where we're doing our, our Ricky end point right there. And because this is a short hop, I'm going to show you the arrival as well while we're at it. So this is the Angel 4. We're coming in. Also, notice Shatner is also in the middle of this. It's not Hackman, but you see here, Shatner.Angel4. That's an entry point. So we come in at Shatner to Sally Gleason. At Gleason, we've got a 280 knot restriction between flight level 300 and 240. Angel between 240 and 190. Uh, Kane uh, at or above 17,000. Boyle at or above 14,000. And then we cross Circus at 270 knots between 12,000 and 14,000. And we expect the ILS. Uh, it says here to expect the ILS to run away 25 left, but you know we're, they use it for both. And we're going to be doing 2-4 right. And we don't have ATC, so we're going to do what we want anyway. We're using that as the transition to go to 2-4 right. And that is our transition over. So that is how we're going to do that. So if you recall, on the... Oh, well, there's one more thing I need, meant to show you on the boat, and I forgot. My bad. Let me pull it back up. This is important. If you do not have ATC... Uh, at least at the time, because they could come on. If you're flying on VATSIM, it could come on. If you're, if you're not flying on VATSIM or on a, a network of some kind, then don't worry about this. But if you are, and you don't have the initial climb altitude they give you, which is usually shorter than what the chart says, this top altitude, this is the top altitude for the departure. So until you have ATC to tell you otherwise, you shouldn't be climbing above this uh, unless there's just no ATC on, then you can do whatever you want. So I will always set the top altitude of the chart if it's given, and then that way if ATC comes on, I'm not all of a sudden automatically going up to a higher altitude uh, without permission. If they don't come on and I'm pro approaching that, I'll just bug up to my cruise altitude, which in this case is 28,000 feet, or flight level 280. So 190 is what we're going to set for our altitude. I'm going to do that here. 190. And we're going to set runway heading, which was 014. <coughs> right there. Alright. So, now these are set. Our box is set. Uh, basically, everything's ready to go. The aircraft is all set. We assume at this point that we would be all done loading. 
of uh, cargo and the peoples and everything else. And so at this point, we're going to call for our, uh, our clearance and push and, and seal everything up. All right, so to do that, we're going to uh, go into our exterior page here, and we need to shut our doors. Now, if we were loading cargo and stuff, we would have had these cargo do these doors open. Actually, so before I close doors, we're going to start the APU up because I wanna, don't want to wait forever for that. So we do need to do the start pump. Start pump on. APU master to run, and then hold to start for a few seconds, and let go. And that's going to start booting up the APU. And you can actually see over here, in a moment, we should see the APU start up. There it goes. If this never happens, check your parking brake, because I think it's set to where if the parking brake's not set, this will not start up. <coughs> I got that impression... <coughs> excuse me. I got that impression uh, reading the manual, so um, that's going to do its thing. While that's happening, we're going to go ahead and shut some doors. So we're going to... We're going to... That says it's open, so we're going to set it to close. The parking brake is set, so we're going to remove the wheel chocks. We're going to remove the cones. We are not going to remove the ground power unit yet. But we will send the uh, Mr. Jetway away, so we're going to go ahead and tell that to go... Go all the way over there. <coughs> and that shows 100 on there. And there we go. APU is on. So now what we would do... Because in the real world, if you disconnect the external power and it's still got a connection, they can get a, quite a shock as those two devices pull away. Because uh, aviation voltage runs at 400 volts. That's a lot of voltage. So you turn off the external power. And you notice nothing changed because we're on APU. It tells you right there that we're on APU, APU. So now we can tell the ground power unit to go away. And I think there's nothing else that I need off of here. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and pull the tablet down. And I'm going to put his tablet away, too, because it annoys me. And we're going to call for push. So perf push back and departure. Here comes our little southwest tug, because it doesn't know what power set is. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. And it takes about two minutes before air is available. There's no like indicator that it is. So the way you can do that and check for that is uh, if you go to the uh, air page right here, you'll see APU stuff. And we can actually go ahead and put APU air on. And you notice how it's not... Um, it's not really turning green yet. I think once that turns green, if I remember correctly. Or maybe I have to actually turn a pack on. Uh, let's see. Nose to the left, me thinks. Departure check completed. Bypass bin inserted. Release parking brake. Yeah, so okay, so turn the pack on. Which we're not going to do right now because we're about to use that air to start the engine. So, all right. So we want to make sure we're about to move the aircraft, so we need to put the beacon on. Beacon goes on, seatbelt signs are on, lights are armed, all that's ready to go. So we're ready to move the bird. So parking brake released. All clear. Start at will. I'm gonna leave the yoke gone for the time being. All right, so we're starting pushback. We can start. Uh, we can uh, clear to start engines at this point. So what we're gonna do is we're going to put our fuel pumps on left and right. We don't have anything in the center tank anyway. The uh, cross bleed is set to open, packs are off, and these are engine start switch. You're going to right click on or left click on one of the on number two first. Two one is the start uh, start sequence. Sorry, it is right click, and then fuel on as well, and it will start to spool up. And if we go over here, actually see it start to run up there. This is just a view I have set with Chase Plane. Here, the, here when the fuel kicks in there, the tone of the engine changes a bit.
All right, and here the engine kind of stabilize out. Set and they're done with the push, so we're going to have to set the brake. So you'll see here the, uh, the N2 is still running up a little bit. It's not quite to stable yet. But our uh, start light has gone out, so we could start the other engine. I like to wait till the engine is stable until I uh, before I start the uh, next engine. That's just my personal habit. You see here a, a bleed indication on this engine now, so to show that we actually have bleed air available for number two. And let's go ahead and start number one. Tow truck disconnect. Bypass. So, and on this. Uh, Engine indication, you have a N2, fuel flow, uh, I think this is total gas temperature or something like that, or target gas, I'm not sure, but it's, it basically it's like the EGT temperature essentially. Uh, then you have your N1 and your EPR, EPR which is an exhaust uh, engine pressure ratio. So it's going to get up there, there's fuel flow, and there we start to get uh, light off, and then N1 will start to come up here in just a moment. There goes N1. And there goes the start valve. This will cycle up to about 24% uh, N1, and about 62 to 63% N2. Now you notice this guy here, this little box, this stab trim right here, and it's white. There's a couple things that it's looking for to configure for both takeoff and landing. And when this box just turns green and is blank, that's our indication that we're essentially configured for takeoff. So there's a few things we're going to do first. We're going to, first of all, our hydraulics are in now because we've got the engine driven hydraulics, but we're also going to turn on the aux and the trans as a backup for takeoff. We'll turn these off once we're uh, above 10,000 feet. But uh, down here, we'll leave those on. They're just going to run. It's basically the equivalent of the, uh, the electrical system stuff. Uh, you notice all the lights are out now on the electrical. That means we're running off the engine generator. So we're going to switch the APU switch to off right there. Fuel pumps are on. Start pump can, whoops, that's not that. Start pump can go off. We're just doing uh, window heat. That's fine. That's all we need to worry about there. Nothing else uh, should require. We do want to make sure we turn our packs on, and this goes back to auto. You'll hear the fans spool down because the uh, the fans that are running everything for cooling can go off because now they're relying on the pack temperature, so don't have to worry about that. Gen APU off, that's fine. We're going to go ahead and turn the APU off. Uh, air off goes first, and then APU off. There we go. All right. Then we need to set a few things. So we're going to do our trim, which is 5.6. So we're going to come over here to config. And we're going to set our trim to 5.6 using our uh, trim controls there. Almost there, 5.6. Oops, a little too far. There we go. And then while we got in that window, I want to do the flight control test. So we'll test left and right. And this one might be the one that sticks. Down and yeah, it does. This is a bug. <laughs> so it shows that once I push the elevators forward, they stayed there. Uh, they are not still there. And I will show you that in a second. If we do rudder left, rudder right. Yeah, when the first time I saw that, I was like, uh-oh. But yeah, if you go out here to the, uh, the back of the aircraft, you'll see that they are not stuck. They are moving like they're supposed to, so. All right, so just ignore that. <laughs> it's a bug. If you hit config again, by the way, oh, no, you don't, no, I guess not, I thought it did that. Go back to engine. I usually leave it on engine when I'm not looking at anything specifically. Uh, if there's an issue with any particular system, you'll get a little light down here that'll light up so you can kind of see what uh, what's going on. But so now it says slat right there, so it's waiting for our slats and flaps. So if we hit the uh, flaps down once, that's going to go to slats. You see down here, slat, down, then slats. That changed now to flap, you'll notice. And we hit that down one more time. This goes to 13, 
and now it changed to brakes. So what we also need to do though is we need to arm the uh, the spoiler. There is no auto brakes in this, so there's no uh, RTO to set or anything like that. We want to make sure that uh, we're squawking correctly, so we move the transponder all the way up to uh, TARA. Flaps are now set. It's just waiting on our brakes. Taxi light, and I'm going to extend the landing lights. I'm not going to turn them on. If I hit that again, it turns them on. So they're extended, but they're not on. If we go over here to uh, this exterior view, you can see it coming in right there. That guy just came hanging down. And if I hit him again, then I'll turn on. And uh, so but we don't want to do that yet. So the landing lights are primed and ready to go. Uh, that's all set. Everything's ready to go now. And uh, it's just waiting on brakes. So if we release the brakes here, which I can do just by pushing the uh, the rudders there, or the brake pedals, um, you see that now goes green. That green box means if we uh, if we move the throttles forward beyond a certain point in the takeoff range, we won't get the eh, 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 takeoff warning horn that something's wrong. It thinks we're configured for takeoff, which we are. So we're going to go ahead and push the throttles forward a little bit. There is a little bit of a delay when you do that. That's fine. That's realistic. And we will start turning the aircraft. Doesn't It takes a little bit of thrust to get you moving, but then pull it back to idle because otherwise you will have quite a bit of thrust uh, quite quickly. You don't want to have too much. So we're going to go this way. I think we're going down here. Vegas is always just a little confusing when it comes to the initial taxi. Uh, yeah, you know what? This is whiskey right in front of me, actually. I think I'm just going to take that to Delta and Delta down, yeah. So we'll do that. So you will have to give it a little power every so often. It's not quite PMDG where the you can basically pull the engines back to idle and it'll it'll stay rolling forever. Uh, but if you leave the engines at power, it will accelerate and keep getting faster and faster and faster. So you got to kind of up and down, up and down, up and down, which is a little bit annoying, but it's okay. Give yourself a little bit of power like that first. Let it roll a little bit and then and then compensate. I find that's the way to go. I find that's the way to go. So this is Zulu. We're going to go one more to Delta. And if we go too far, we'll actually cross runway one. And we don't want to do that. This is uh, Fly Tampa's Las Vegas. It's beautiful scenery. There's a strip there. MGM. You got uh, the Mirage, the Luxor, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So absolutely glorious. Very sad that we didn't have FS Expo there this last year due to the pandemic. But looking forward to it in San Diego in 2021, hoping that it will happen. This should be Zulu here. I can see right here this is our uh, runway cross, so uh, this should be Delta. I said Zulu, I meant Delta. So we're going to turn down this way. We're on the ground, so right now you notice that says TA only because it's not going to do a resolve because it knows we're on the ground. Uh, I do recommend uh, go up here and hit this traffic button. You see a traffic in the box. Now you'd actually see traffic if there's any there. Uh, weather radar, you'll notice, is off at the moment. We usually leave that off until we're a little closer to the runway. Um, so that's there. Uh, increase the range or decrease the range with, uh, with that guy. I'm going to put it at 10. I th well, actually, I'll probably put it at 5 for takeoff. When I'm hand flying, I like it as big as possible. It gives me the best uh, visual of what's actually happening. Because we are going to hand fly. Hand flying this plane out of Vegas in the boat is actually a lot of fun. Just because the terrain is interesting. All right, we're crossing 268 left. I know there's no traffic because I'm not on a network, but normally you'd want to verify. At this time, you put your strobes on because we're crossing an active runway. I think they're actually, in the real world, I think they're landing on 2-6 and they're uh, taking off on the 1s. So. And we'll just leave the strobes on at this point because we're down here. I'm going to go ahead and turn the weather radar on now to weather, past text, test. 
and that should go switch away in a second. There it goes. Weather radar is showing on. It blinks at you because it knows you're on the ground, and it doesn't want you taxiing to the gate with that on because that would irradiate your ground handling personnel. <laughs> That's not good. Nobody wants that. All right, so at this point, we'd call out on the Unicom, power set 232, runway 1 right, lining up for takeoff, departure to the south on the boat 8 with carrier traffic. All right, strobes are already on, so we're good there. One last little double check. We can make sure our flaps are 13. They are. That box is still green. It is. We can check these little uh, notices here, no smoking, seatbelt, and CDU2 menu. So it likes you just not to have to be on the menu on CDU2, though, I'll clear that out of there. Blue messages are really just status messages. When it's, um, when it's a different color, uh, that's when you want to pay attention. Blue is kind of more just like, hey, by the way, this is on, just so you know. It's more just a, a ready alert. All right, so we're ready to go. So the way this works is uh, you see on this uh, PFD here, I'm going to go ahead and stop the brakes down here so we just stop rolling. Um, this is your um, enunciator for your mode. So your, your um, speed mode, your uh, heading mode, essentially, your, your lateral, lateral, and your vertical. So to, to arm the takeoff, you hit auto flight once and the box goes away here and you see takeoff clamp and this is in takeoff mode AP off autopilot is off so what's gonna happen is I'm gonna advance the throttles and at a certain point it's gonna take over and if I let go of mine you just see these throttles continue to go up into their position takeoff position and then uh, you'll get the message that says clamp or I think it says clamp and basically at that point the throttles are locked to where they should be, so that way if you need to pull the throttles back in a rejected takeoff, you can. But you don't have to touch the throttles and give them any, any place to go for the takeoff. Not until you hit auto flight a second time will the autopilot actually kick on for the other mode. So we're not going to do auto flight again right away because we're, we're going to hand fly a lot of this. But just know we're, we want to make sure this is in nav. So see nav armed. And uh, this is set for 140 to pitch. And so after that, we'll probably, it may switch over to FMS speed on its own, but if not, we'll hit FMS speed, and then it will pitch hold for the speed, or at least command it on the flight director for us. That's the idea. All right, so we're all set to go. I do need to set this to 3004, because that was a change. That was an update. That's set now. Everything else is good to go. And 19,000, yeah, everything's ready. OK, so landing lights coming on. You can set the uh, taxi light to the landing light position as well. It's just a more higher intensity uh, landing light. And so we hit auto flight once, so we're going to go ahead and pull the engines up to about 50%. And you notice if you saw that, my throttle command commanded it here, but they stopped at their, uh, their required position. So it does not say clint, but just says. But this changes to takeoff thrust. So now it's set a takeoff thrust, 80 knots. Going down the runway. I'm going to take my hand off the throttles at V1 so I don't accidentally pull them back after V1. That's V1, and that's rotate. Let's gently pull back on the yoke, rotate. And as we pitch up, we verify that we're climbing, positive rate, gear up. And just hold on that flight director right there. We just passed 26, so that's our, our limit there. So you notice the flight director starts to move over. We're going to go ahead and start our turn toward Bessie. And this went to dash line, so it automatically switched over for us. So it's holding, it's uh, verifying the speed it needs to hold for us, so that's good. We're above our flapper track speed, so we're going to go ahead and pull in the, uh, the flaps. We'll go to slats. And there, just set climb power. It's a 
very easy aircraft to fly. It just feels very good. Holding on that flight director bar there. And there we go. You just saw our speed bug up to uh, 230. That's the limit for Bessie. And so we're going to pitch down to accelerate a little bit as well as continuing the turn to align ourselves with Bessie. And once we pass the uh, orange slat retract, we'll go ahead and pull the slats in. There's slat retract. Slats coming in. And we got to watch the uh, the speed here. I'm going to kind of lead the flight director a little bit because I don't want to bust that 230 limit at Bessie. I find you know one of the most beautiful scapes in flight sim is desert. If you ask me, it's just absolutely gorgeous out here. So after Bessie, I think it'll bug us up to 250. We'll find out. Yep, there it just bugged us up to 250. As we continue our turn to, uh, I think it's Whitla. So the autopilot's still off. You see the, the white box around the uh, the nav stuff. But you see nav 1 is is pink and pitch is pink for 250. That's what is commanding the, uh, the flight director. So you want to make sure those are set correctly so that way the flight director gives you, and I'm not paying attention, I'm actually busting my speeds here. Start pontificating. Slow that back down. We're not quite past 10,000 yet. Okay, now we are. So now you see the pitch comes back down because it's going to accelerate us up to uh, 30, 308, I think that says. 306, 308, something like that. So at 10,000 feet, landing lights can go off. And we're also going to turn off the uh, aux and trans pumps. Just verifying our packs are on. The uh, 10 checks are just kind of a general, you know, look around, make sure everything is set for cruise at this point. Not that we're in cruise yet, but we're starting a climb through where we can't breathe anymore as humans, so we got to be careful. So we can de -arm, disarm the uh, spoiler like you just saw me do. Uh, weather radar. If your weather radar wasn't on before, this is a good chance to catch that and turn that on. It's not going to be an issue today because it's California and there is no weather. We don't believe in weather out here, apparently. I mean, yeah, I know technically we're in Nevada at the moment, but not for long. Actually, actually at this point, we might technically be in California. <laughs> I'm trying to think where Prim is. But yeah, this is a really fun departure in this aircraft because you're kind of bobbing through these hills and it just feels it feels more like you're flying the plane you know you are but you know you just you get that sensation more I think I think so your flight director isn't always going to do the greatest job in the world of uh, especially when it comes to your speed holding so you just kind of kind of watch your speed tape. You notice as I'm pulling the plane up, the flight director's following me. <laughs> like, oh yeah, you're too fast. That's how we busted our speed below before too. So it's really crucial that you don't just watch the flight director. You got to keep an eye on that speed tape. Otherwise, the flight director may lead you astray. You know, they, they say you don't want to ever chase the flight director. In this case, you don't ever, you almost want to have the flight director chase you in some sense. It's not really the case on the uh, the horizontal, it's really just the vertical path that you have to worry about that. 
All right, at this point, we're uh, pretty stable here. I'm going to go ahead and put the autopilot on. So we just hit this again. You notice the bar goes away. AP1 is now illuminated there. And so now we are on autopilot. To kill the autopilot, if you need to, you can set up buttons on your yoke. This is the uh, autopilot disconnect, and this is the auto throttle disconnect right here. These are toga switches. Don't push those. The other way you can get around the system, if, if these buttons are giving you hassles, if you pull down these two switches, this is the auto flight system override, and uh, that will also disconnect everything. So that's kind of like an emergency, like, ha <laughs> help, the autopilot's doing weird things, and controllers are yelling at me, and what have you. So there it is. That is how we get the uh, the angry puppy, as we call it, the uh, the Boeing 717 off the ground. And the process we went through today took quite a while, but that was because I was explaining it. When you're doing this in the real aircraft, you can get this thing off the ground pretty stinking fast um, if you're not focused on teaching people how to fly it. So it really is a gorgeous aircraft. And TFDI are currently working on a uh, an MD-11. I don't know when that's going to release, but uh, we are all very excited for that. After losing the PMDG MD-11 uh, coming off from FSX, uh, it'll be really fun to have that guy back. So waiting with bated breath. All right, so since I wasn't really paying attention, two things. One, we passed our uh, transition altitude, so I need to uh, pull that, and it switches back to 2992. But also, we forgot to bug the rest of the way up to our cruise, which is 28. So we need to do that. That is, that is uh, to be honest, and again, this is more of an issue. I'm pontificating here and explaining. But uh, you want to be aware of that. If you don't have ATC and you've set an altitude there, to make sure you don't uh, just sit there forever and go, why did I never reach cruise altitude? Well, because. <laughs> so we're passing Ricky right now. So we're just uh, exiting the SID for the Vegas side. And... Uh, On to Shatner. Shatner is looks like 24 miles away, so it's really not far. We got a. I have a feeling our top of climb and top of descent are going to be really close. We can check that by increasing this out. Actually, I think it's CR. Oh, there's our top of descent. So top of descent is uh, after Smash. So we'll see. We should. This the the TFDI climbs pretty well, so I think we'll get up there and then just back down again. But. While we're in the climb here, I'm just going to show you. I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to show you where to do it. <laughs> um, if you need to, if you're flying on a network, there is a good chance um, that you may have to, at some point, uh, let me find it here. I think it's in flight plan. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a good chance if you're flying on a network, especially at a busy event like an FNO, you may have to hold. And for sim pilots, holding is one of the it's one of the things no one knows how to do. I mean, some people do. But in the simulator world, we don't ever worry about it because we're not generally dealing with traffic levels that require a hold. So we, look, we know how to land, we know how to take off, we know how to program the FMC three ways to Tuesday, but no one seems to, they tell you to enter a hold, and everyone's like, oh shoot, how do I do that in this plane? Oh crap. So... <laughs> This is where you would do it. Um, basically, in, in some aircraft, you actually have a hold button. Here, you actually go into the flight plan, and you pick the waypoint you're going to hold at. Now, if they tell you to go to a place not in your flight plan, you'd be going to do the direct to, putting a direct to in, and then at that point, doing going into the hold. 
So, but we're not going to do that. Let's just assume we were going to be holding at Shatner, because that's the next one we're coming up on in 11 miles. And so they come on, they say, we need you to hold at Shatner. You click this hold button here, and this is where you put in this information. And until you push the insert button, none of this will do anything. So, but you see an inbound course, the turn direction, um, you've got the uh, time or distance here. So sometimes ATC will give you this information, sometimes they'll say hold is published, and sometimes they'll just say nothing at all. So you can kind of, I guess, make up your own mind. But if they give you um, the, the turn direction you want, you would put an L here if they want left turns as opposed to right turns. If they said they want you to do 10 mile legs, you would put slash 10 in here, zero, and then that way it would not use time. Right now it's going to be a minute and a half leg, so it's going to be a minute and a half in each direction. And uh, and then the inbound course is the, the, the course for the hold, so you want to make sure you get that right as well. So as long as you have all those in there, insert it, uh, and then the aircraft will hold for as long as you need to until you use the exit command. So I'm not going to do that because I don't want to screw everything up, but um, that's how you would hold. There are um, tutorials out there on what the different hold entries are and what the different things mean for that. I would encourage you to look up a guy called Aviation Pro. He's a, a Dutch gentleman, um, and he has a lot of a lot of good VATSIM videos, actually. Um, and especially when it comes time to cross the pond, do the cross the pond event, I always end up watching one of his videos just to as a refresher course on oceanic procedures, but uh, he has a couple talking about holds and holding procedures, and it's, it's really good for the mechanics of a hold. What you then have to be able to do is translate that into how your individual aircraft takes the hold. Now, at the end of the day, what you can do is, if you can't figure it out, you can be very Neanderthal, just set up a heading select, watch your, you know, zoom this guy all the way in onto Shatter, and just calculate out, okay, I'm 10 miles away, I'm gonna, you know, 180 turn to the left or the right, and then head back to, and just do kind of a rudimentary manual hold, but it requires you to be really on top of it, and you may be in that hold for 20, 30 minutes, depending on the event, so uh, it's always better if you can tell the aircraft to do it. The Quality Wing 787 will not. You will have to do it manually. Not that this is a video about that, but um, I did have it confirmed by a Fly 787, who is a former 787 captain, who said the FMC does not do the hold at all. It will do the, it will fly the hold one time, and then auto exit you out. And you have no control, and then it won't do it again. Like you cannot get it to hold after that. So super annoying. Who that is? All right, so we've reached our cruising altitude, which is good because that means. Um, that means we didn't have to uh, we didn't have to go down before then. So normally at this point you would turn off the uh, seatbelt sign, let the passengers move about the cabin a bit, uh, leave that no smoking sign on, and uh, and it's just basically fly the course at this point. So if, again, if you uh, need to use a direct to, if uh, if uh, they give you a shortcut, uh, you can use the direct to uh, to direct somewhere earlier in your flight plan or a different waypoint entirely and put that in there. Otherwise, just go through with the flight plan. If you need to edit any of these um, these points over here, I believe you just are clicking on them. And um, yeah, speed at or below, altitude at or below, altitude at, altitude at or below, descent. So you, you stick them all in here and, and execute them as necessary. So this one has some stuff in it, so you actually see speed so you need to edit constraints or add constraints. Um, just make sure you click on the the right side of these and then insert them as appropriate. We're not really needing to do that today, so that's not an issue for us. But if you did, that's where you would do it. Now we're coming up on our top of descent. You can see the, the arrow there. That's uh, about 15 miles out or so. And so what I do if you're not flying in a in a air traffic environment. So you're not flying with VATSIM or Pilot Edge or something like that. And you've got to do this all on your own. What I would recommend you do is you look at the star. And in our case, is the Angel 4. And I would look at the bottom of the star. So when I say the bottom of the star, I mean where you are ultimately ending up. 
which in our case is circus. So at circus, we need to be, we cannot be below 12,000 at the end of the star. We do need to be below 14,000, but not below 12. So if I don't have any to worry about being vectored down a certain way, then I will simply tell my FMC, hey, go to that point and it will fly these points. If they're in the FMS correctly or the MCDU correctly, it will fly them as appropriate. So 12,000 is what I'm going to do. And so we're going to come over here to this and we're going to go ahead and select 12,000. Altitude. Yeah, and then hit perf or prof or whatever it is. So now you see hold 28,000, but uh, profile to 12,000. So right now the profile is saying you're right where you should be. So, and the the altitude alert was just because it sees 12,000 and goes, oh, we're, we're way high. <laughs> you're but you're more than a thousand feet away. Uh, so you, you hit that, that kind of gives you the cue that it, that it did its job. When we hit that top of descent, you'll see over here on the uh, PFD, see this, or this uh, circle, will drop. And what the aircraft's going to do is try and maintain that circle with our altitude. So it will drop accordingly uh, on profile. So for those of you that are not as familiar with a, uh, a PFD, your primary flight display, uh, obviously this is your altitude tape, your speed tape, speed in indicated airspeed. This is not ground speed. This is not true airspeed. This is indicated airspeed. So the higher you are, the pressure drops, the slower the speed will be, but you're still going pretty stinking fast. We're doing Mach 0.746 at the moment. This is really above 28,000 feet, 26 to 28,000 feet. You're going to be relying more on your Mach speed than anything else. Uh, I'm trying to think if it gives you, yeah, your ground speed is over here. So we're doing 420 knots over the ground. We're doing 450 knots true airspeed, but we have a headwind, and that's why there's a discrepancy between true airspeed and ground speed. So uh, obviously the, uh, the indicators here, yellow is a caution for overspeed. Red is you are overspeeding the aircraft. Don't do that anymore. Uh, this is the maximum gear extension. And as that goes down, you'll see slat extension, flap extension, flap retract, slat retract, uh, all of those things. And this is your uh, uh, vertical speed. So how much we're climbing or descending. You got your compass heading here, and then your autopilot uh, indicators. And this represents your aircraft. And this is your flight director. The horizontal bar represents your vertical path you should be aiming for. The, hor the vertical bar represents the horizontal path you should be aiming for. And your goal is to put the airplane dot right and be where those two lines meet. And then these uh, blue bars up here, these little flags, that is your stall bar. If you, cl if you put the aircraft up to that at this current speed and altitude, you should stall the aircraft. So don't do that. So we're coming up on our top of descent. It's a nice short little hop for this. It's perfect for a tutorial flight. Just enough time to talk about the aircraft and then head on down and do a landing. So as we come up to that top descent, we'll see that, uh, we should see that little magenta indicator start to go down. There may be an indicator, I think there's an indicator here for profile as well, you'll see. Yeah, there it is. So see how that guy just dropped down? Actually dropped off the scale, so he's going to start going down. And he's going to try and put that little pink indicator right there. And you see it says add drag, so it wants us to add drag. So we're going to go ahead and put out some spoilers. Because it's wanting us to drop, it doesn't want us to speed up too much. This cracks me up though, so as that goes away... Oops. Stop it. Generally, my indication with the add drag when the uh, when the throttles start coming back in, that's when I'll pull the drag back out, even if it still says add drag, because it's at a point where the computer is going, well, wait a minute, I need thrust because you're adding drag. Well, you wanted the drag. 
don't, don't, don't tell me that. Yeah, so I basically took that magenta indicator and it moved it over to there. So this is where your profile is now. So as long as that that guy is on the scale, you're good. Uh, if this drops down to the point where you get a little indication showing a altitude discrepancy, that just shows you how far off profile you are. So if this was down on the bottom and you had an indicator saying minus 2,000, that would mean you are basically 2,000, the profile is 2,000 feet below you. So you're 2,000 feet high, and vice versa if it was up there. So, And sometimes that's good to see because that will tell you, even if the, the system doesn't tell you to add drag, that may be an indication for you to, hey, let's put the spoilers out and make this thing descend faster because it's we're going to be above profile the whole time and we're going to be too high. So over here we have uh, the pass coming out of uh, Highway uh, Interstate 10, this is uh, Palm Springs out here, there's a whole bunch of wind farm activity over here, leading into the uh, Southern California Basin. If we were flying in from Phoenix, we'd pretty much be flying through that gap, I mean at, at about this altitude, but just because we're coming from Vegas, we're a little further over. using the angel. The angel. So you notice it's kind of stopped our descent here. Now I think, let me see if it'll do this. Yeah, if you put data on here, you can actually see at Gleason, we need to be below 300 but above 240. So it's holding us like right at 240 right now until we pass Gleason. And now it's sending us down because we're about to head to Angel. So it was holding us there because we had an altitude constraint. We don't have any at Angel or Kane. Oh no, yes we do, I'm sorry. It won't show it to you until it bugs up, apparently. That's kind of annoying. So basically the next one we need to be at or above flight level 190. That's going to bring us awfully close to... Um, uh, to transition altitude, so we're going to look at our t um, our weather for Los Angeles and get a altimeter setting. And actually, what I'm going to do because of our proximity and our distance, I'm actually going to get two. So first of all, I'm going to check the weather of Los Angeles. The weather of Los Angeles right now is showing uh, wind two five zero at Niner, eight mile visibility, few clouds at uh, twenty five hundred, overcast at thirty five hundred. Uh, temperature two zero, altim uh, sorry, temperature two zero, dew point one four, altimeter two nine or nine or seven. So two five zero at nine, so that means yeah, we'd be landing on the two fours and two fives, so that's typical for LA. Uh, two nine or nine or seven is the altimeter. I'm also going to look up Ontario because I happen to know Ontario is right in here, and so if we were flying on a network, oftentimes they'd give us the Ontario altimeter first. Uh, because that would be more accurate for this area before we got in close to LAX. Now in this case, looking at the altimeter for Ontario, it's actually the same thing. It's 2909 or 7. So in this case it doesn't matter, we're just going to do 2909 or 7. But so we have our winds and our, um, and, uh, and our altimeter setting. So I'm going to move this guy out of the way here for the moment. And I'm trying to remember on this one. Oops, no, don't do that. Yeah, so don't change it. Unlike the 737, I'd forgotten on this one. Unlike the 737, you can't set this and then activate it. It's going to change it immediately. So uh, we're going to keep it at 2992 until we drop below 18,000 feet, and then we'll change it. On uh, some of the Boeings, you can actually change this, and it will put it in like a standby, and then when you push it, it will switch it. Not so with the 717. So don't do that. Um, if you need to, on the uh, the displays up here for the for the um, the autopilot, you have a uh, switch here between uh, indicated airspeed and mock speed for the the speed box, heading and track, uh, which is really the difference between European and American kind of style. 
uh, over here between feet and meters. So if you're going to fly in uh, China or Russia, they, they operate in meters. It's super annoying, but <laughs> yep, they do that. And so you can change those. Uh, you can also change your, uh, your altimeter setting between uh, inches of mercury and hectopascals if you're operating pretty much anywhere besides uh, uh, America, it's going to be hectopascals um, with some uh, some very few exceptions, but most of the time it's going to be hectopascals. Uh, and then also a magnetic and true uh, course if you need to see stuff on here. Most of the time you're going to have it a magnetic because that's what you're flying with all the time. But you would use that if you were up near the pole. Now I don't know why you would take this thing anywhere near the pole, but you know, hey. To each his own, I suppose. Your um, radios for tuning up ILSs and stuff is all going to be done through the uh, MCDU. The only radio heads you're going to be touching is for comms, and that's done here. So this is COM1, COM2. So you notice there's no... Altitude. Um, sorry, what? That was weird. Where are you? Not sure why it gave me an altitude call out there. We're set for 12,000. We're passing about to pass 17. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but that's, uh, we we passed transition, so we're going to set uh, 299 or 7 now, right there. Oh, but just changed my approach to 14. That's interesting. Okay. very well so you come in here and a lot of times it will do this for you but you need to verify so LAX that's pulling in the VOR right now ILS it hasn't put it in there yet I think it will but we're not gonna we're not gonna wait for it so I'm gonna pull up the approach plate for uh, LAX for 24 right and we're going to verify 108.5 and 251 is our uh, localizer and approach course. So we put 108.5 slash 251. And you can verify I uh, India Uniform Whiskey Uniform, which is not correct according to the chart. <laughs> wonder if we're picking up another ILS. Maybe by putting that in there this far out, maybe that's why. That's interesting. Because it should be India, Oscar, Sierra, Sierra. All right, we're going to watch that. Again, there's a lot of stuff in the LA base, and we're really far out. So that may be why it's just looking at what is the closest one and going, oh, yeah, you want that? So Altitude. We'll keep an eye on that. The other thing we need to do is go over here to, uh, uh, sorry, init, not init, it is approach, there we go. Approach for uh, Los Angeles, and it's going to give us our um, speeds here. There's really nothing you need to do on this page unless you want to change it other than referencing what it is. So uh, you're verifying your, your slat extends and, uh, and things, the minimum speed at which you want to Put out your your flat your slat so don't go below that without flaps. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and give it some more drag, and again we'll do this until we start seeing that uh, power lever come up there significantly, and then we'll pull it back. Uh, but right now it's set to uh, 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 flaps 40 extended and it gives us a VAP of 139 and a VREF of 134. If we wanted to set a flaps 25 landing we could click that and that'll give us our numbers for that. But we're going to go ahead and do the flaps 40, 40 on down. Altitude. Alright so we're coming up on circus now. So now I'm going to set in the uh, the final approach uh, altitude, which is 2200. And we're 
we're going to add some more drag because we're going to have to go below 10,000 feet here in a moment. It's very hazy here in the LA basin today, probably because of smoke from fires. California is basically on fire right now, everywhere. <laughs> I kind of got to finesse it with that. Uh, at this point, we go ahead and turn the seatbelt sign back on. Oftentimes, I'll do that at 18,000 feet. In this case, I want to make sure it's at least done before 10. Uh, landing lights, we're going to extend them. They'll actually add a little bit of, um, of drag. You see that coming out right there? We want to make sure we have those on as we cross below 10,000. We're actually between we're underneath 11,000 now, so I'm going to go ahead and click them to on. We'll leave the taxi light where it is. That's going to be our uh, memory item that we do have clearance to land. In this case, we're going to give ourselves clearance to land, but that's okay. I'm going to have that anyway. Again, just n taking note that we're on profile there. We're on speed at the moment. We don't have any flaps in yet. We'll do that in a little bit. You notice there's our uh, warning bar there. So as we start to descend a little further here, we'll start to get our, our slats in. We are Altitude. we are below the slat, slat extend uh, limit here. That's at 280, so we can put the slats out now. Uh, but I'm going to wait a little while longer. I don't want to put them out too early because the computer will start commanding slower and slower speed. Um, and I don't want to do that yet. So we're just going to let it go for the time being. Showing that. That's interesting. Altitude. Oh. All right. Well, if we never get the ILS coming in, then we'll know why. Although it looks like, yeah, we don't have it yet. Yeah, no glide slope, no. Uh, So what I'm going to do, I think at uh, probably around uh, 11 or so, uh, we'll go ahead and put the slats out. Altitude. Uh-huh. I think it's just yelling at me because of the uh, restriction. I think that's what's happening. Even though we bugged down to 2200, that looks like what's going on. And that's fine. Not really much to see at the moment because of all the clouds. With uh, Los Angeles like this, you have a really long run in into the uh, to the runway. Some some you do not have nearly as long of an approach, and so you want to be a lot caref more careful with your uh, speed management. Altitude. And therefore getting your slats out a little bit earlier, but uh, with this in this case, we don't have to really have to worry a Jetsa is the uh, the kind of main last point And that's usually where you would get sent over to tower So We do have the localizer now Still says IUWU. I wonder why it's got the wrong identifier. That's interesting. Kind of curious to tune up the left and see if it's. Uh, what's the left localizer? 1117251. Altitude. Format error. IGPE. Yeah, that's not correct either. That should be uh, India Hotel Quebec Bravo. <laughs> I 
I wonder where it's getting these from. All right. They appear to be right, like, as far as where we're going, but... 108.5... Slash... 251. Yeah, that's weird. Altitude. Okay, we're about 10 miles from Jetsa, and we're right about 5,000 feet. So I think we're going to go ahead and put in, oh, it's bugging us all the way down there, yeah. So now we're going to add our, our slats, and this is where we could have put in like a flat 15 and skipped the 13 here, but... Uh, We'll go ahead and... Altitude. Oops. Helps to hit the right button. Go ahead and do flaps 13 and 15, or 18, I guess, the next one. There we go. That puts us right to that limit. And we do want to make sure these guys are back on as a backup. Stop. Beep break. Speed break. Yeah, yeah. It's because the flaps are out now. It doesn't want us to do that. So, it's just going to have to make do. We're actually above the glide slope at this point, so we're doing okay. So, I think between. Uh, 25, between 3,000 and 2,500 feet, we're going to go ahead and put out the uh, gear and, well, put the final bunch of flaps. Going to go ahead and arm the speed brake at this point. Did we, we put the landing lights on, you know. Stabilizer motion. Uh-huh. And we're going to go ahead and arm the approach. And we'll go ahead and go gear down and flap 25. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. I can shut up now about that. Stabilizer motion. And we'll go flaps 40 because we're right at that limit anyway. So. So we're now fully configured. Flaps are 40. Landing gear's down in three greens. Uh, spoiler is uh, is armed. And approach is armed. So we'll see as we get uh, as we cross the glides here. I'm actually kind of surprised it hasn't picked up the localizer yet because we're like right on it. All right, so there's the green box, so it knows we're configured now. It says we're good to land. I don't have the runway in sight yet because of the haze, uh, but we should have it at eight miles. We're just the runway is just inside of ten right now, so we should be getting it any minute. In fact, I'm barely being able to see. I think the edge of the field. Altitude. I'm really wondering if, uh, oh, that's a little bit of a boop. All right, I've got the runways on this side. The two fours are a little more recessed, so we should be getting them any second now. And yeah, it's not. It's the, uh, the, uh, the landing system is not cutting in, so I think there's a goof with going on with that. So we're going to go ahead and take control. Autopilot. And we're going to do it ourselves. So you notice these say autopilot off now. We're now in control of the aircraft. I'm going to pull the throttles back so we don't get too fast here since we're descending. 
but we're completely configured, we're ready to go. We're going to say we passed jet cell, we're going to say we have uh, landing clearance, so we're going to put the taxi light there as we come in. And we're high because we let it pass the glide slope, so i got to try and make up for that. Pull the throttles back while we dive a little bit here to get back on glide slope, or what we think is glide slope anyway. I'm gonna have to investigate. I've never seen it do that with the uh, the I the ILS here at LAX before with the wrong um, identifier. So I'm not sure why that is. One thousand. Put the speed back in. Thousands checked. But. You know, like I said, on a day like this, you don't need the uh, the ILS. I mean, it's you know, you hand fly the dumb thing. It's it's a great aircraft to hand fly. Just be careful with the speed because it you'll feel like you need to put a lot more speed in, and then it'll get away from you real fast, like it just did for me there. So uh, just be aware of that because now we're now we're high again suddenly. So it's all about kind of leading the aircraft a little bit so you don't get into those situations. As the scenery loads in, stop that. 500. Four hundred. Three hundred. Minimum. Here's the in and out. 100. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 5. Pull the power out. Let it gently go to the ground. There it is. Engage reverse. Fly the nose wheel down. Remember, there's no auto brake, so I'm just kind of watching the reversers and then hitting the brakes on my own. We're going to taxi off right here, it looks like. Whatever this is. Stow the reversers. Ooh, minus 167 feet per minute. I'll take that. Sim Toolkit Pro telling me that. That was a really nice landing. Like I said, this aircraft is just fun to fly. It's, it, it just flies so nice. All right, we're going to cross uh, runway uh, too far left here to Alpha Alpha. Again, we'd have to be careful about that if we were on a network, but we're not, so I know there's no traffic. I uh, will turn our weather radar off at this point so we don't irradiate anybody. And we can turn our landing lights off. Taxi light goes to the normal taxi light. And we will take Echo to the ramp. We're going to go to tech, um, Terminal 3 is going to be our parking spot today. I keep reconfiguring LAX with all the construction, so I'm not sure who's parking at Terminal 3 these days. It was Delta last I checked, but that was like a year ago or more, so who knows who it is now. It may still be Delta. I don't know. All right, we want to bring our flaps back in, make sure our spoilers come back in. Stab trim we can put uh, back down to the zero mark. And then let's start the uh, APU up here. And we'll wait till we see APU available up there. We actually should see it spooling up here in just a moment. There it goes. 
APU is coming online. Weather radar is off. Landing lights are off. Strobes can go off because we're off the runway. And let's tell GSX where we're going to park. So we're going to go to Terminal 3. And we're looking for, we're a small aircraft. They have a small gates here at Terminal 3. No. They're all medium. All right. Well, let's go for, let's go for gate 33. Uh, let's go Alliance Ground. This is uh, FS Dream Team's LAX version 2, I think it is. I think there's a version 2. I think it's... So it's uh, fairly up to date. It's uh, obviously there's a lot of construction and new terminals being built right here now that it doesn't have yet, but it's got the new uh, Tom Bradley International Building, which looks gorgeous. And in general, it's a very nice scenery. Highly recommended for P3D. LA is uh, Los Angeles is probably what I consider to be my my home airport as far as a major international airport. Uh, it's the closest one to me that I frequent the most as far as spotting and what have you. Uh, obviously where I live in Fresno we have our airport but it's you know <laughs> it's what we call international in name only it's it's not very big it's it's okay but it's mostly regional stuff. The, it gets away with being called international because we do have like one or two flights to Guadalajara, Mexico through Valeris and Aeromexico and that's it. Everything else is stateside so well, technically it's International Airport, I don't know if I'd go that far. So I gotta see where, I'm trying to remember where gate 33, is it on this side or is it, I guess I should look at the stupid, uh, 33, it is on this side. sitting off the pier right here. Yeah, that's why my guys are right there. Da da. All right, so we will turn the taxiway light, taxi light, not taxiway light, taxi light off so we don't blind the marshaller because that's not very nice. Uh, let's see if Chase Plane will cooperate with me. Ooh, it will, look at that. Find my marshal. There we go. There we go. Yes, yes. Wave your arms. I know. Put your hands in the air like you just don't care. All right. Parking brake is set. There's the APU available. Make sure that's on. And we're also going to put the APU air on. We're going to set this to open. And we're going to kill the engines. Beacon can go off. I think that was a beacon. No, that was a little bit light. Beacon can go off. There we go. And the uh, taxi, uh, sorry, the uh, seatbelt light can go off. We'll also go ahead and kill the hydraulics. So we do not need them anymore. And let's get the gate attached. Operate the jetway. Confirm. Jetway's coming in. All right, so that is how we do that. I mean, then shutdown is basically just going through and killing all the systems once you've once you're in the place where you can do that. So uh, we want to make sure the TCAS uh, stuff is to standby. We don't need to be broadcasting that for the tower. Um, the uh, override uh, when I killed the autopilot, I have controls set up my yoke to hit this button and that button. But if you don't, like I said, you could always hit those. That's the uh, auto flight override right there that'll kill everything so that's a good way to do that if you don't have that ability and it's sometimes when you're bouncing around it's hard to find those buttons and you need to do it fast <laughs> so I highly recommend mapping it if you can but if you can't that's fine but that's uh, the TFDI it's like I said it's really not a difficult aircraft to learn it's uh, just knowing kind of where things are and how the auto flight system works I'm not sure why the approach didn't work I've had it work before 
I really think it's tied to the fact that it's pulling in the wrong data somehow for the uh, the course here, and I'm not sure why it was doing that. I'm gonna have to research that a little bit, but uh, yeah, it should have it should have done that much better. And I wonder if I had let it put it in, put it in itself, if it would have been fine. It, it could have been because um, I went in here and did it myself. But yeah, it had ILS two four right, so. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Whoops. Wrong button. <laughs> Wrong button. So once we have that, we would go into the tablet here and we would tell the doors to open. We could open the cargo hatches there. We could get ground power so we could turn the APU off. We could put the wheel chocks on so we could disconnect the parking brakes, let them cool. And... Uh, that's off so there we go so now we could go ahead and put ground power on we could turn the uh, APU off and we could turn the APU off and we turn the packs off at this point because now there's no APU air so that is the uh, that is the Boeing 717 I hope that was uh, useful for you a good little learn uh, learning the aircraft uh, systems uh, if it was, leave a like and uh, let me know in the comments if there's another aircraft you'd like me to uh, to do for a tutorial. Um, I have all of the PMDG aircraft. I just know a lot of people know those already, so I haven't done them first. I think these are a little more obscure. I uh, also have the FS Labs, and I'd be happy to do a tutorial for the FS Labs A320. I do know that enough to be able to do that now. So that may be the next one coming, would be the FS Labs A320. That's a very complicated bird if you're used to Boeing. So, but uh, yeah, leave a, uh, leave a like in the comments. I do stream on Twitch uh, three times a week generally. Right now it's Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Mustafa. So if you want to see more things like this, uh, just hanging out with people, and you can watch me fly these planes in real time, ask questions, uh, that's really the best way to do that. Um, happy to, to teach what I know and pass on. We also have a number of airline pilots that uh, are in those streams a lot of times that can speak into the real world operations and can also clarify things that I don't know. So, because I am not, again, I'm not a real world airline pilot. I am a, I'm a armchair pilot that uh, flies flight sims so all right guys we'll see you for the next one hope to see you over on twitch come say hi come let me know you found my videos on youtube and uh check it out <laughs>